Good morning. Welcome again. My name is Jeremy. I am the lead pastor of The Journey. And uh, you can probably tell this morning my voice is not very uh, strong. And so there may or may not be several moments where I sound like a seventh grade boy this morning. I'll try to avoid that. But I appreciate your prayers and, uh, and patience with that. Uh, what we've been doing uh, this fall is looking at this series called Facing God, and we're really saying, uh, hey, Christians say all these things about God. What, who is he really? Uh, and how do we bring our life, our experience underneath uh, who God is and what he is doing? And it's important because like, even in our country, in America, right, a secular country, 90% of people will say they believe in God. The problem is that we say, well, what God do you believe in or what is that God actually like? Then, all, then the answers are divergent. Then the answers go everywhere. Then we don't know because it's, it's so many different things. And the Bible is very clear that we can't just simply uh, uh, worship or come to or, or, or the God that we imagine, the God that we want to be the case. Uh, we have to worship, the Bible says, in spirit and in truth as God has revealed himself to be. And so what are we doing? We're looking at these different aspects of God. And today we're looking at uh, his goodness. And it's important we start with God because that's where the Bible starts. A lot of times we think the gospel starts with us. The gospel starts with the world and the brokenness in the world. The gospel starts with me. The gospel starts with my sin. The gospel does not begin with all of sin and falling short of the glory of God. How does the Bible begin? In the beginning, God. It begins with God. The gospel doesn't start with our sin. It starts with our God. And that's where we have to start. Who is he? What is he like? And, and today we're looking at his goodness and how can Christians say that, that God is good when there's so much bad and, and all these kinds of things. What does it mean to experience God's goodness? What is his goodness? Well, first of all, a couple things. It's not. A lot of times we think about God, if we say God is good, you know, it's like he's a sweet little grandmother in the sky, you know, and she's getting older and doesn't get out much, but she still has warm, good feelings about her grandkids, and she'll send them a card every now and then, and if Social Security came in, she puts a five spot in there or whatever for you, right? That's not the essence of God's goodness. Uh, or a lot of times we, we've used it in a, in a negative connotation, right? Like we say, oh, yeah, he, he's so good, she's so good. In other words, like they never do anything fun. They never get out in life because they're so good, goody two-shoes kinds of good. God's goodness is not like, God's goodness means this. It is if you have ever experienced anything, if you've ever enjoyed anything in life, if you've ever experienced any pleasure, any joy, any positive, uh, if you've ever had pleasure in anything, that is a result of the fact that God is good. Because that didn't just happen out of nowhere. It came because God created it and made it to be. When he made creation, what did he keep saying? And behold, it was, sorry, it was what? Good. And it was good. And it was good. And he made man and woman in his image to be like him. And behold, that was very good. If you've ever experienced anything pleasurable, that is a result of God's goodness. God's goodness is not just warm feelings. It is his predisposition to be generous, to do good to us even when we do not deserve it. God's goodness is the fact that he's radically generous to us. He's predisposed to that generosity in spite of the fact that we do not deserve it. That's the gospel. And this is how Christianity is so unique. Look at verse 8. Verse 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. See, it doesn't say believe in, believing in God gets you nowhere, right? James 2 says the demons believe in God and their theology is better than yours and they tremble at the presence of God. They believe in him and it is useless. See, Christianity is unique. Every religion tells you believe in God, follow him, do this, do that. Christianity says come and taste and see. That's an experience. See, if we go out to eat tonight and you order an amazing steak, Right, and that steak comes, man, it's like juice on the plate, and there's like a lobster on top, and it's just amazing, right? <laughs> it's making you hungry right now. And I say, man, that looks like that tastes good. And you're like, it does, so back up, bro. You know, like you protect. Or you could say, dude, the steak's amazing. Taste and see. 
I can look at that stake, I can know in my heart, I can have all the faith in the world that that stake is real, that that stake is going to taste good, that that stake is amazing, but until I taste the stake, I don't know it. So you can believe in God, you can know about God, you can get your theology right, you can be a good person, you can be a moral person, you can come to church, you can do all those things. You can know all about God, but until you taste, until you know him and experience him, then you have not yet come to be a Christian. You've not yet met Jesus Christ. So he says, come and taste. How can we taste? How can we experience God's goodness? Not just know about it, believe in it, but experience it. This predisposition to do good to those of us who don't deserve it. Number one, you have to believe he wants you to experience it. A lot of us believe God is so, so frowning and angry that he can maybe take time to check your box and say, okay, come on, come on in, I'll, I'll take you. That's not the character of God. We serve a God who wants you to taste and see that he is good. He wants you to taste and see his generosity. I mean, he asks you, look, look, at, look at verse 4. This is David's psalm. He says, I sought the Lord, and he answered me. Verse 6 says, this poor man cried out to the Lord. Verse uh, uh, 15 says, the eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous. His ears are towards your cry. Verse 18, the Lord draws near to the brokenhearted. He saves the crushed in spirit. He's saying, call it out. Believe, believe it. Call out. Cry out to God and, and, and ask him for it. That's one of the first things. We have to believe he wants us to experience his goodness. And a lot of us, like, a lot of us, we, we can't because we, we know about God's greatness. But we don't understand his goodness. This was my spiritual, this was my spiritual journey. From, from, from a young age, I always believed in God, and I believed he was a great God. I believed he was a holy God. I believed he was a, a, a God of law and standards who demanded perfection. And the churches I started out in, they preach, uh, they preach about immorality. They preach about God's holiness. He's a burning fire, and not an ounce of sin can be allowed into his presence. And, man, that, like, that freaked me out. So I was like, I'm not going to have an ounce of sin in my life, and I'm going to do everything right. I mean, I'll even be nice to my little brother if I, if I have to do that to get God to like me and accept me. And I literally did everything, and I freaked, and, 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 and all kinds of stuff. Freaked. I was always freaked out because God was so holy and great, and, and I had no sense that he had any love, mercy, goodness, kindness. He was severe. And I, I would get freaked out all the time, even as a little kid. I remember... Uh, I was a little kid when the movie Ghost came out. You remember that movie? It's sort of about the afterlife, right? Not exactly a Christian view. But, but I remember at first, like, you know, Patrick Swayze is the main character, and he dies early in the movie, and he's a good guy. And I was like, and he becomes a ghost, right? And I'm like, oh, I can do that. Like, I could be, a, if I get to ride the subway and help Demi Moore make pottery, like, I could, I could do that. And then, like, another part, a bad dude dies in the movie, and all of a sudden these, like, shapeless, dark goblins come up and suck his soul out and take him into the depths of the earth. And I was like, that's, that's going to be me. That's who I am, right? And then even, even as a kid, like the, the, the prayers that we teach our kids, like this prayer freaked me out. And some of you, like some of you probably know this prayer. You prayed this prayer. This was a prayer that was on a plaque above my crib. As, before I could even read, the, I knew what those words said because we used to recite them. And it just, and I, I've heard like other people make fun of this in the past. And it like, I was like, that resonates with me. You know what the prayer I'm talking about? Now I lay me down to sleep. I mean, this thing freaks a kid out. <laughs> now I lay me down to sleep. I, I would start, I was like, are we in Tales of the Crypt here? I felt like <laughs> I'm entering a sarcophagus here. Sitting in the dark, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And then the last line, I'm three years old. If I die before I wake... It's a pleasant bedtime story. <laughs> if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Who knows? Maybe you will. Maybe you won't. Better pray. <laughs> Sweet dreams, baby. Night, night. <laughs> I was freaked out. I knew about the greatness of God. I knew that I 
Every time I tried again and again, what if I go to sleep tonight and God goes, look at this day, 90%, you were okay, but 10% didn't make it. Sorry, not taking your soul tonight. Knew about the greatness of God. But I didn't become a Christian until I understood the goodness of God. The goodness of God that said he is predisposed to sinners like you, Jeremy. To show generosity and grace so much. He is so good that in spite of the fact of his holiness and his greatness and that he can't accept any brokenness, sadness, or sin in his presence, he sent his son to pay for that for you and take that away. He loved you so much. And when I believed that, I tasted and I saw the goodness of God because I became a Christian. That's how you become. Some of you have never tasted and seen. Some of you have never tasted and seen the goodness of God because you, you, you believe in him. But you haven't said, I want Jesus to be my savior because he paid for that. You can taste today, just simply say, Lord, I believe in you. I want to taste and see. Jesus paid for my sins on the cross and rose from the dead. And some of you, you became a Christian a little while back or a long time ago, and, and it's been a long time since you've tasted, since you've experienced and he's saying, do you believe he wants you to? Do you cry out? Do you call out? Like some of us complain that we don't taste and see and we're not even at the table. We don't even have a fork in our hand. And he's saying, God wants you to taste and see. Is that happening? Do you see the goodness of Jesus coming to you? So number one, believe he wants you to. Uh, number two, look beyond your circumstances. To taste and see the goodness of God, you have to look beyond your circumstances. If you tie your satisfaction in life, if you tie your happiness in life to the circumstances and people around you, you are committing yourself to lifelong slavery. That's lifelong slavery. What the psalm says, what the Bible says, uh, uh, is, is that, you know what? People change, circumstances change, God doesn't change. Rue yourself in his character, not your circumstances. You have to look beyond your circumstances. In fact, uh, even the new science of, of happiness, there's a science of happiness right now studying how can people be happy. They, they conclude that, that only 10% of your happiness is, is due to the circumstances in your life. Only 10%. Well, the Bible's been saying that for thousands of years. This is what David does. He roots himself in the character of God. See, I want God to change everything out there, right? I want God to change all the circumstances in my life. And God is saying, okay, maybe I'll change that. But I want to change you. I want to change your perspective on your circumstances. I want to change your heart in your circumstances. I'm like, I don't like that. I just want you to change this thing or this person that's making this happen. And God says, no, I want to change you. Look beyond your circumstance and root yourself in the character. This is, this is what happened, and it will be transformative. Look at verse 5. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces will be radiant. Never be ashamed. He says it will transform you all the way through, even your countenance, even your face. You know the people who have the, the face, right? They're always complaining, murmuring. Like they have a permafrown. They're just always angry and critical. You want to be around those people? Of course you don't. You want to be one of those people? Of course you don't. And he said, God says, I will transform even your face, your countenance. But if you're always focusing on your circumstances, you'll never, you'll never be happy. You'll never be satisfied. You'll always have permafrown. Because they change, they come and go, it's up and down, there's no predicting it. But God, his character, his goodness doesn't change. And you say, well, you don't understand my circumstances. You don't understand how hard my life is. Look, David's writing this psalm. David's thoroughly realistic. Look how realistic he is about the problems, the circumstances of life. Verse 4, I sought the Lord. He delivered me from all my fears. The word fears there is not um, like, oh, I'm, I'm afraid I might get a speeding ticket if I, go, if I go too fast today. The word is for terrors, like night terrors. The word is like panic attacks. The word is like, have you ever been trying to go to sleep at night and you can't sleep and you feel like there's a, 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 a lead weight on your chest and you cannot breathe? That's the kind of fears and terrors he's talking about. Verse 6, this poor man cried, and, and the Lord saved him of all his troubles. 
verse 18, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and the crushed in spirit. He's talking about brokenheartedness, being in want, being hungry, having the threat of death over his life. The Bible is thoroughly realistic about these things, and yet God says, in the midst of that, God was faithful. Not because you read through the psalm, nothing here says, his, he, he wrote all the, nothing, his circumstances did not change while he was writing this. That's why in the end, verse 21, 22, will say, well, in the, in the final day, this, this will happen. But verse 18, he says, I don't know what's about to happen, but I know the Lord draws near to the brokenhearted. I don't know what my circumstances are going to be, but I know who the Lord is. I know he hears my cry, and I know he'll draw near to me in the, in the midst of that. See, David, you're like, well, I don't, you don't know my circumstances, but look at David's circumstances. Go back to the very beginning of the psalm. Look up above verse 1. There's a little, little uh, uh, different font there, right? But in the Hebrew Bible, this, this would have been just like verse 1. But what this is, this is one of 14 psalms that has a, an historical event tied to it in the life of David. And this this is what it says, of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, so he drove him out and he went away. What is that? Probably don't know that story. Well, if you go look back to 1 Samuel 21, you'll see the story. You know the story of David, right? David's saying, out of this story, I wrote the psalm. That's what a lot of the psalms are. Here's my experience. I'm writing a song out of my experience and bringing it up into God's presence. That's all you're doing. And David does that again and again. He revels, he writes, he recounts. Do you do that? Do you journal? Do you write music or poetry or create art or, or write it down so you can revel in what God has done and always remember it and go back to it when you're in this crushed of spirit, when you are brokenhearted, when your circumstances are dire, you can go back and go, but remember who God is. Remember what he did. Remember how he delivered me the last time. Because we are a forgetful, forgetful people. It's what have you done for me lately? And David, that's what David does with the Psalms. And this is, a, he wrote this Psalm in a specific moment in his life. You know the story of David? Uh, he was the second king, not the first. Who was the first king? Class king, Saul. King Saul is the first king, but he was a wicked king. And God said, I want a man after my own heart. And he plucked David from obscurity, the youngest son of a nobody, tending fields as a shepherd. And David's rise to prominence was meteoric. After, after he was anointed to be king, he wasn't yet king, but he was anointed. What did he do? He went out and he fought Goliath, right? He kills the giant Goliath. He's a mighty warrior and a hero. You know what his reward for that was? No taxes for life. He didn't have to pay taxes ever again in life. And he gets to marry the king's daughter. And he ended up becoming best friends with the king's son. He started writing music and everybody's listening to his music. He starts, that people start actually writing songs even about him. And so David is doing awesome. He's like, Lord, thank you for calling me. This is great. Like he's got his own, you know, reality show and his own station on Pandora and everybody loves him. Until Saul goes, yeah, everybody loves him too much. And Saul gets jealous and Saul attacks David and Saul drives David out of the kingdom. And all of a sudden... David is isolated from his wife and his friends. He has no companions. He is hungry. He, goes, he has to run to a town and beg the priests for bread because he's so hungry. He's on the run. He's got a threat of death in his life. And then he makes a mistake. He goes to a city called Gath. Gath was not an Israelite city. It was the Philistine city where the king of the Philistines lived. And oh, by the way, if you go back and read, Gath was the hometown of that giant Goliath that he killed. And David's thinking, right, like, for us that doesn't make any sense, but David's thinking, you know, it's not like today, like his picture's not all over Instagram. So he's thinking, I can go there, nobody's gonna recognize me, I'll pretend to be a mercenary in their army, and then that way Saul can't get to me, but I'll have provision, all that kind of stuff. Well, too bad, David, they recognized you. They recognized, they said, this is David, he's the one who killed hundreds and thousands of Philistines. And they locked him up. And that's what he's talking about, the troubles, the night terrors, the fear, the, the lack of food, the threat of death hanging over his head. See, David had every one of those things in one circumstance. And he goes, I'm looking beyond the circumstance to the God who called me, to the God of goodness. I don't know if I can see him right now, but I'm calling on him. See, what would you do in that circumstance? What, what could David do? Well, the story says... He decided to pretend to be a lunatic. He decided to be a madman. He just got, made his hair all crazy, eye, all wild-eyed, started scratching all over the doors and the gates, letting, uh, uh, like, like he had rabies, like drool and spit running down his beard. And King Achish comes like, our asylum's full here. This dude's acting the fool. We're, he's out of here. We're, we're sending him away. 
And so David escapes. And it's easy, it would be easy for David to go back and tell those stories like, look how clever I was, I outsmarted. But here, he's humble enough to say, here's the story within the story. It wasn't my cleverness, it wasn't my strategies that saved me, it was God that saved me. It was my prayer. It was me rooting myself, not in my circumstances, but in, my, in God's character. That's what he did, and, and, uh, and he escaped. He escaped. Verse 6 says, he rescued me from my troubles. You look beyond your circumstance. You have to also do that sometimes with our feelings. God calls us to be authentic to our feelings, but not subject to, the, to our feelings. Be authentic about them, but not subject to them. I love authenticity, we live in, but we live in a world where like authenticity is like the end. The Bible says be authentic. God can handle your anger, your fear, whatever it is. Like God, David just throws it all out there. Put it out there, but know that you're bringing them to God to shape and form your responses, your emotions into a God-like response. And so we have to be authentic to our feelings, but not subject to them. In other words, there's a lot of whims and feelings I get. You know, when I'm driving down the, the interstate in St. Louis, I get angry at some of the slow drivers around me. But if I'm subject to that anger, then it's going to be crazy, right? Like, you don't want that. Be authentic to your feelings, but not subject to them. This is what David does. David chooses, in verse 1, to praise. He says, I will bless the Lord at a few times. No, I'll bless the Lord when things are going my way. I'll bless the Lord when I feel like it. No, I'll bless the Lord at all times. His praise is continually in my mouth. For a long time, I thought that you give thanks when you feel thankful. You praise God when you feel like praising God. What David says is no. You're authentic to your feelings. You're not subject to them. In other words, David starts with praise. He's in the midst. He's captured under the threat of death, and he starts with praise. He starts with, look at verse 9 and 10. Is he hungry? Does he have lack? He says, fear the Lord, his saints. Those who fear him have no lack. Lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. He seems to lack a lot of good things, but he's just saying right now, I'm praising you, God. He goes on and praises him for what will God, not only what God is doing now, but what he will do before David even knows what it's going to be. He just puts the praise in his, his mouth. He's saying, don't wait to feel thankful to give thanks. It's like, don't wait to, to feel generous to give your money away. Don't wait to uh, feel like loving your spouse. Love your spouse. And then you'll start feeling more and more like it. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you want to have a life, if you want to become a grateful per person, you want your radiance and your countenance to change, make thanksgiving, make gratefulness, make praise a discipline of your life the way that you would make prayer or scripture reading or anything else a discipline. I would challenge you to try this. Uh, I started trying, trying this back, this is, I don't know when, a friend of mine said to me, one, this is like a year ago, Jeremy, you're choosing, you're choosing to live in self-pity right now. And I was like, I, said, I won't tell you exactly what I said at that moment. But I said, <laughs> eventually I said, you know what, you're right. You want to change your heart, change your habits. So I just challenge you, start and end every day just with three praises, three things to give thanks to God for. Even science has proven that that will change your countenance, that will change your whole self. Just start with praise. Be authentic about your feelings, but not subject to them. And then, David says, you got to embody the goodness you experience. You want to taste and see the goodness of God, embody his goodness. Look at verse 11. It says, come children, listen to me. I'll teach you the fear of the Lord. He started to invest in other people. Are you investing in anyone? Are you teaching anyone? Are you saying, come on, let me show you how God works. Let me show you God's goodness. Let me invite you to come and taste and see. He begins to invest. And he says, you've got to embody that goodness. Look at verse 13 and 14. Keep your tongue from evil, your lips from deceit. Turn away from evil. There's a negative side. Stop gossip, lying, slander, complaining, murmuring. Get that off your lips. Because it's going to depress you. Stop focusing on what you lack and saying, if I have the Lord, I lack no good thing. Instead, speak thanks to God before his deliverance even comes. 
And then he says, do good, seek peace, and pursue it. I said many weeks ago, we not only preach the good news, we're supposed to be the good news. See, God's goodness means his generosity. And so we're supposed to be people of radical generosity. His goodness means radical generosity despite the fact that we deserve it. So we're supposed to be radically generous people seeking peace and, and taking deceit off our lips and saying, this is what God wants for the world. This is the, the peace I seek in relationships in my na- with my neighbors and in the neighborhoods and the nations in our city. Seek peace, pursue it, do it. Love mercy, do justice. Embody the goodness that you experience. That's what uh, Jesus did. Jesus' kingship. David prepares us for Jesus' kingship, doesn't he? Like, who was the king? Who was supposed to be the king, right? And he came. You imagine what David's probably thinking? Like, think about his circumstances, his emotions. He's like, you told me I was going to be king. I went out there and, you know, slayed a giant for you. I, I risked my life for you, God, and now I'm starving and in prison. And what are you doing? Ever been like that with God? Lord, what are you doing? Where's your goodness now? And yet David says, no, I'm going to look beyond my circumstances. I'm not going to be subject to my feelings. I'm going to embody the goodness and the character of God. Because that, that, that's who Jesus, that was his kingship, right? Did he come? He, he was born and they set him up on a throne and said, everyone come and worship? No. He came seeking bread. He came hungering and thirsting. He said, I thirst from the cross. He went and driven into the desert, fasting for 40 days and 40 nights and tempted by Satan. He was homeless and, and poor. He should have been king. He should have been coronated. Instead, he was humbled. He wasn't only isolated from his friends. He was betrayed by them. He wasn't only under the threat of death. He was killed. See, David doesn't even know that yet, and yet he's rooting himself in the character. He has a bigger perspective. He has this last thing, which is an eternal perspective. He says, get an eternal perspective. He says, man, God's doing something. He starts using in verse 21 and 22 what will happen. Verse 21, affliction will slay the wicked. Injustice will not reign forever. Those who hate the righteous will be condemned. But the Lord redeems the life of his servants, and none who take refuge in him will ever be condemned. In other words, one day, a flood of God's justice and judgment will, like a tsunami, wash over the earth, and there will be one rock, one fortress, one shield, one refuge, Jesus Christ. And he says, you can take refuge. You can taste and see. You can hide yourself there where the judgment has already fallen and the fire has already burned, and now there is life and health there. Come and taste and see and take refuge there. See, all the old, we, don't, we, we have so many comforts in this life, we don't even understand this. The old Christians understood this. Like you go back and read the accounts of the martyrs. Uh, Justin Martyr, year, like 160 AD, the, the Romans say, we're gonna, we're gonna kill you and your followers. And he says, you can kill us, but you cannot harm us. You can kill us, but you can't harm us. If, if that sounds crazy to you, then you don't have an eternal perspective. And if this life is all there is, that is crazy. But if there's a God of goodness and a God who will one day set all things right, then you can take refuge in that. You can taste and see his goodness. See, the way that we can taste and see God's goodness is because Hebrews 2 says Jesus came and tasted death. It literally says in Hebrews 2, 9, by the grace of God, Jesus tasted death for all of us. Jesus Christ took death the light of life, the the king of the world, he took death into his mouth and swirled it around and swallowed it down. He swallowed your sin and death all the way in, took it all the way down so that he could break the power of death and one day redeem all things and make everything new, make you new, your countenance new, your radiance new, make your neighborhood new, make this city new, make this church new, make the whole universe new. Have you tasted and seen the goodness of God, that he's predisposed to do good to you, so much so that he sent his son to taste death so that you would never have to? I don't know where you are right now, what circumstances you're facing, what feelings, what perspectives. God is saying his goodness, his character is 
greater than all those things. You see this if you think about how kids respond to their parents. And I saw this a few years ago with my daughter, and I'll close with this. Three years ago, we had to take my daughter to Children's Hospital. And whenever you have to take your kid to Children's Hospital, it's not a good moment, right? And uh, she had to have a very important uh, procedure, and just to alleviate any concern, it all went well, she's fine, she's good, um, everything, everything was fine, it's not the point of the story. The point of the story is how she reacted in the moment, because when we got there, Everything's a rush, right? And there's doctors and nurses everywhere, and there's noise, and there's machines, and she's being thrown in a bed in a place where she doesn't understand, and people are surrounding her, and they're poking and prodding, and needles and tubes are everywhere. And, uh, and my daughter already didn't, didn't like, you know, like a lot of overwhelming noise and people and strangers, and so she just freaked out. She freaked out, and she was squirming, doing everything she could to fight, these, fight them off, get them away from her. And I come in the room, and she looks at me, and it was like a look of, thank God dad is here. Because she knows my character. She knows I'm daddy's little girl. Daddy loves me. Daddy will never let anything bad happen. She knows quite literally that I will rip off anyone's head that ever tries to harm her. Literally, I mean that. <laughs> literally. <laughs> she knows her dad's character. And she's looking around where she feels like she is being attacked. Her circumstances, her feelings, everything is going wrong. And she looks at me like, the hero's here. And when she had, gave me that look, I'm telling you, it was almost off right there. I was almost out of the game. We're going to have to call this thing off because my daughter told me to. But she's looking at me like, why aren't you helping me? And then it made it worse because the doctors and nurses said, we can't keep her still. We can't hold her down. We can't get these things in. Uh, we can't get the mask on and all this stuff. And, and all these medical advances we have. Why does it like putting an a anesthesia, why does it have to be like Darth Vader with a fog machine? Just like <laughs> coming in, you know, like, of course you're freaked out. Now I lay me down to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and she's looking at me like, Dad, save me. And instead the doctor said, we can't hold her down. Dad, we need you to help. And I start moving toward her and she's like, here it is. He's going to knock some fools out. And and instead, I take my hands and I physically submit her to that pain. And she looked at me with anger and disbelief. I can't believe it. In that moment, she had a choice. I can believe in this temporary moment, this temporary pain, these temporary circumstances, my temporary feelings. Or I can trust that I know my dad. I can trust in the character I've always known him to have. I don't know if it happened or not, but it's like her eyes change from disbelief to trust. You're my dad. I don't understand this. But you're my dad and you're good. And in every moment of life, you have that choice. I can choose to look here, look here, believe in these circumstances, this, this temporary pain. Or I can trust in the character of my father and know that no matter what, even death, you can kill me. But you cannot harm me. Because as verse 20 says, not a bone was broken on the Lord Jesus. There's an eternal promise beyond this life and this moment. And he says you can taste and see have you tasted and seen? Have you ever put your faith in Christ? Do it now. Have you just gotten rote and routine? Taste and see the Lord is good. Choose to see it. Let's pray. 
Jesus, there are so many things that we cannot explain, so many things that we don't understand and we don't know. And just like my daughter, I could not explain it to her. I could not convince her. I could not give her all the reasons why she needed to submit to this care. So, Lord, in the midst of all the pain and brokenness and sadness that certainly exists in a congregation as large as ours, I pray that you would lift our eyes beyond our circumstances, our momentary feelings, our momentary trials, and may we see, may we taste and see that you are good. Your steadfast love endures forever and ever. Amen.